Welcome back to the Iris uh, Global Green Room podcast. Uh, today, I have a really special, special uh, episode for you guys. I've been this is something that I've been milling around in the back of my head for a long time, and uh, the the stars aligned. <laughs> uh, two two stars in particular, uh, Peter and Debbie Wilcox, and and they agreed to come on and uh, for me to pick their brain. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Peter and Debbie Wilcox are, they are. Uh, two of our most spectacular missionaries. They're all spelled spectacular. I say that about all of them, guys. But uh, <laughs> but truly, uh, these guys have been on the field for years. Um, uh, they are currently located in Brazil. Uh, but up to that point, they've been all over Mozambique. Um, they've run some of our uh, one of our bases in I want to say Tet, but it's not Tet. Where you guys were in Lashinga. Yeah, they ran our base in Lashinga. They've lived in Pemba. Um, they've done so many different things all the time. They've had uh, raising this amazing family of seven kids, um, and and many of which still are running with us to this day. Uh, one of my favorite things is I get to work with your daughters, your son-in-law, your son, and uh, you guys are just a huge part of Iris Global and the ministry that God's been doing around the world. Um, I want to say this just right off the bat. Um, we're not going to go into like a deep dive into their history. There is another podcast on our Iris Global YouTube channel. I believe it's 57 uh, with uh, Nathan Coetzer, who did about an hour long interview with you guys. Got the history, got the story. Uh, but today we want to go after a few uh, specific topics. Um, so we're going to jump right on in. How are you guys doing? How are you guys doing? We're doing fabulously. Yeah, uh, um, it's a challenge in that it's uh, challenging us to go deep with the Lord and to be consistent in his fellowship and uh, learning things from him that we wouldn't have had time to learn when we're busy running around. <laughs> Great time to be living. <laughs> yeah, this is a new season for you guys. You've been in Africa. I think you were in Spain before, if I remember correctly, yeah. and then Africa. Uh, yes. You've been in Africa for years. And yeah. how, how is it being back in a... I mean, a first world or a country in Brazil. It has its uh, new challenges. <laughs> we rise to the occasion with the Holy Spirit, right? Yes. <laughs> so, but yeah, the, it, it's good. The Lord told us that our time here in Brazil was going to be a reshaping, a remodeling, a, a preparation, because we'd been in Africa for so long. I think we lost contact with a developed world. <laughs> and uh, so he has us here on purpose, apart from anything else that God wants to do through us. Yeah. God is wanting to re reshape us. Yeah. He's getting us ready for something. Come on. I, I've, you guys have been a huge part of my life. I remember uh, when you guys first moved out to Pemba. It was right around the time that my wife and I moved out in Pemba. I remember watching your, your kiddos running around. Yes. Uh, on base now to see them grown up, you know, beautiful young men, young women. Uh, now with kids, it's just such a blessing. And and you guys, uh, most most people will, uh, you know, only one kid or two kids on the field, and then when they, the three they go back home and they get back into a quote unquote normal lifestyle. You guys, you guys lived on the field with your whole family in some really like crazy times. Um, one of the one of one of my hearts in in sitting down and talking with you stemmed from a conversation that I had with Peter at a men's group in Pemba, and we were discussing uh, a verse I believe is in Matthew where it talks about um, oh I, I should have prepared this uh, it talks about uh, Jesus had had <laughs> just risen from the dead and he's sitting with his disciples and he's saying I'm not going to be here anymore. And he, he turns to them and, and he says, I'm, I'm not going to be here any longer, but um, go, uh, go and buy a sword. He, he, he says this to the disciples. And the disciples go, what, how many swords do we need, Jesus? And, and, Jesus, and, they, and, he's, and, uh, and he says, well, go and sell your cloaks. And, and if you don't have one, go and sell your cloak and buy one. They say, how, how, many, how many do we need? And they say, well, here, we have two. And Jesus goes, that's enough. Uh, two swords is enough. And then, like, it's like this crazy little dialogue where previously um, Jesus corrected one of his disciples for cutting off the ear of one of the centurion guards. And the conversation, that little conversation that I had with you, Peter, at this men's group, 
got my my mind just spinning. Like, where do where do you defend yourself biblically? Is there a place in the scripture to defend yourself, and what does that look like as a missionary on the ground um, that's serving in a dangerous place? And I know uh, from your experience that you guys have faced some very very dangerous situations. Uh, I think two or three times you have been attacked, um, at, held at gunpoint. Could you maybe walk us through some of those times, what happened, and and what was going on in your minds when those were taking place? Okay, I'll, I'll do a little bit of a background sure. uh, description. Uh, uh, in 2010, Annalisa and Antoinette and I went to Spain because God took us there. It was totally, I didn't want to go, but God took us there. So we ministered there, and that was an amazing time. And on the way back, we stopped in South Africa. And in South Africa, we were in, invited by an Indian background pastor to come and minister in the church there with him and to stay a couple of days with him. So we went and we just arrived in his house. We just sat down to have dinner with him and his family. And two guys walk in through the kitchen door and uh, ask the pastor for his wallet. And we're still at the dinner table. The girls had gone. They'd gone to the bedroom of the, the, the children of the pastor. And just he and I were sitting side by side at the table. So I thought, well, this guy ha has some very good <laughs> friends, you know? Here they come in, they ask him for money and so forth, and he's giving him some money. I thought, wow, pretty good friends. And then uh, one of them comes around to me and just hits me in the head and I fall to the ground. And I get up angry, you know, <laughs> indignant, you know, and I just went for him. Uh, he had a gun and uh, the guy that was with the pastor took out, a, he went into the kitchen, got a big knife and started going after the pastor and the pastor was protecting himself with a chair, a wooden chair. And so I was going after the other guy who had the gun and I was just talking in tongues and I said, you're getting out of here in the name of Jesus. You're not taking anything and you are gonna leave and so on. And so that was, I was at the top of my voice talking to him. Okay, so that's the way he fought that time was in the spirit, right? Mm -hmm. Not with this, but he was praying in tongues and telling the demon it was gonna get out of there. Because it's not against flesh and blood that we fight. And if we can remember that at all times with the help of the Lord, that really helps. Yeah. But a sec, another just time. Just a second. And so what happened was the girls, the girls heard this. Mm -hmm. And they came through the hallway and they saw, they thought I was casting out a demon. And uh, so they came in and they saw the guy with the gun and they quickly ran back and hid under the bed. <laughs> How and old were they? They were they're in their twenties. Yeah. They're in their twenties. That was before Antoinette went to Pemba to serve there yeah. with Heidi. So, so uh, anyways, long story short, uh, he the guard the the robber lines us all up, and he pistol whips on Lisa, and blood is just pouring down. And t t two seconds, you can't just say that uh, a guy pistol whipped your daughter. W it, walk me through this moment because it sounded like uh, you you know there was a chair you're fighting the girls come in it, so later on these guys these guys basically took control of the house they they didn't go upstairs but they took control of the house but they were confused they were they were so nervous and the, one of the guy the, the guy with the gun said I can he took out the chamber with all the bullets yeah and he said look I've got eight bullets here and I can shoot all of you right now. And, and I said, you're not going to do anything. And I began to share the gospel with him. And I began to share about the love of God to him. And, and so forth. he put the bullets back into the gun, he lined us up, pistol whipped on Lisa. And then somehow, I mean, the Lord just must have come and put terror into their hearts. They just went out to the kitchen. They took on Lisa's bag. I said, you're not taking that. You're bringing it back because it had all our passports in it. And um, so he threw it back in, and um, and they took off. It was really just gone. They took off, yeah. and um, two, yeah. two seconds. I'm sorry. What is going through your mind as you watch your daughter getting pistol whipped? I I really 
um, at that moment, I suffered for it, but I couldn't think of anything to do. I was just there in line and just praying, just interceding, just interceding, just interceding. Afterwards, uh, as soon as they went out the door, we pressed the alarm button. In five minutes, about three police cars arrived and an ambulance arrived and so forth. So we were able to take Ed and Lisa to the hospital, okay. get stitched yeah. up and so forth. And yeah. So that was the first time. What are the, the other, what are the other times? Uh, there's a few times, but the, another time that I wanted to speak about was, uh, I'd been wiping up and the, a big knife was, you know, on the bench top. And I felt in my heart, just put that away. So I actually put it away. And then that night, actually, for the first time in Lishinga, we had a bunch of robbers come. And I was pregnant. I was a, a week to, 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 having, to, give, yeah, to give birth. And, uh, yeah, I was pregnant. And when we heard that there was robbers outside, it was because Peter went outside to check why one of the guards was yelling. And when he went outside, he met a bunch of robbers. How, how many is a bunch? So there were... Okay. Well, at that moment, what I could see, there were about four. They had grabbed our guards and they were tying them up. And, and I went out. It was about 30 meters away. And so I, I walked. There's pure pitch dark. I had my torch and I shine them up and I see strange men. And I just gradually walked back to the house and I locked the door. Yeah, they threatened him, but he came back inside. Actually, the dog followed him, which was kind of nice. But um, I, I believe angels also were there because they didn't come into our house. They went over to another and God protected there too, to one of our houses, one of our mm -hmm. groups of friends. But this is the point I wanted to say. Um, Peter said, where's a knife when he came in? <laughs> where's a knife? I wanted to go out there and fight. Yeah. <laughs> well, now I guess he's got a pregnant wife and he's thinking, what's he going to do? You know, it was kind of the flesh probably at that moment. But also just protecting me, you know, yeah. he, he, he loves me and he was wanting to look after us. And, and I said, do you think that's, do you think that's the way to fight? That wasn't how you fought last time. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh, yes. <laughs> so everyone, we all start praying and praying and And then God just took over and actually made those guys run away eventually too. Amazing. But that was really a miracle. They did come back another time and it was a big, actually a big difficult moment for the missionaries that were there at that time. Okay. What is, so this, is this that third, that third kind of major, I know you've had a lot of stuff over the years, but this is that third major one we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you just very briefly fill us in on what that looked like? We weren't actually at home. We'd actually okay. gone to Pumba and they rang on the telephone to tell us that our that night, the first night we were gone while we were traveling, we're arriving there. They were attacked. Yes. Mm. And they said, your, um, the base is being attacked right now. So, I remember that my knees just went to jelly and I just kind of ran into the bedroom, hopped on the bed and started trying to pray and trying to quote Psalms. The lights were out. There was a blackout. We couldn't even like see one another much. The rest of the family were walking around interceding, um, interceding and God did do a miracle for our friends. It was wow. a very difficult moment, but God saved them. He saved their lives. They were wow. beating and, and it was very hard. Yeah. But yeah, he saved them. I, I just I I understand this because I know you. I love you guys. I and and we hear these types of stories on a fairly regular basis. Just having all the bases that we have, but for somebody that this is just out of their realm of understanding, most people would immediately build high walls, and we do that. We have walls around most of our bases have have walls around them, barbed wire guards guns, you know, whatever. Talk, talk to me about that process of being, um, Peter, of being a father, wanting to, that, that guttural instinct to protect everything. Uh, yes. and, and, and at the same time, navigating this obedience where, where the Bible's very clear that we will face persecution. We, we yeah, and, and stuff happens. How, how, do you, how have you balanced that as a father? I, I think it's been a journey. Uh, I can remember uh, in my time in Spain and in Mozambique dreaming, how would I respond mm. if if robbers came into the house or something? 
And so if you think of being a guy, you know, we dream up all sorts of ways to combat yeah. so forth, you know. Uh, but in the moment, it's the faith in the Lord that kicks in and, um, and uh, mm. you respond to a situation knowing who the Lord is and you trust him. Yeah. I remember when we were driving up from Beira, Dondo Base, up to Pemba, and we had to go through that conflict region where Renamo and Frelimo were in, in conflict. And we had to go through that. And the girls didn't want to go because they were, they were all their friends said, you're crazy, you're going to die on the road. Right. We didn't want to go. So we said, okay, well, let's let, put it before the Lord and see what the Lord says. So together as a family, we sought the Lord about it. And God spoke specifically to those two girls, Annalisa, I mean, Miriam and Michaela, and said that they were to go. And he gave them a specific date um, to arrive there and a specific date to come back. And, and, so, and so the next morning, there were smiles. They went to bed crying. They came, they, went back, they came back in the morning happy. And so we left and we went and we went through situations, but in peace. Wow. And we knew the Lord would take us there and the Lord would take us back mm. because the Lord spoke to us that he would do that. And... Mm. Uh, so we could trust him and his word and and know that what he says is true. We can trust him in that and be I, at peace. I think that's very key. I think I was reading these days about in Hebrews where it talks about um, today, today, if you hear the voice of the Lord, you know, to, to obey him because don't be like those people in the desert, you know, who, who didn't go into his rest because of unbelief. Mm. And so I was, I was just thinking about how anxiety in any moment um, really is unbelief and how we can only just trust the Lord that in that very moment, like he promised, when, they, when you're brought before judges, when you're in these difficult moments, he's going to give you what it needs to go through yeah. that moment, the grace yeah. for that moment. Yes. When, when, uh, were you there when Brother Yoon was in Pemba? Yeah. yeah, I, I, as I was driving, for those of you who don't know, Heavenly Man, uh, Brother Yun, amazing story. Uh, he was he was uh, tortured in for his faith in China, and I was I was driving him, I, don't know, I think back to the base from meetings, and I said, you know, did you ever struggle? Like, did you ever attack someone? Did you, like, did you ever defend yourself? You know, you're you. I think he went in and out of prison many many times, and each time, just horrific things happened to him. And he said, I, I definitely, in those seasons, I question my faith. I, 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 this is the heavenly man. Is to, you know, Brother Yun is telling me this. Like, you question your faith in the middle of persecution. You question whether you, whether you were hearing him or not. He's like, of course. And I said, did you ever do anything to get out of it? And he's like, oh, yeah. He said, I'd do whatever, whatever I could. He said, one time they, they arrested me and we were driving. And he said, I got to go use the bathroom. And he, he said, I, I had my nice tennis shoes on that day. And he, he, he was going to the bathroom, uh, jumped a wall and ran away, like ran away. He, he defended himself in, in one sense, right? I know he didn't physically yeah. harm any, any, anyone, but, but those moments, those decisions in those moments, the, the, the faith moment, or, or do, you, do you have faith for that moment? Or... Or do you rely on a sword in that moment? Yeah, uh, I think it's it's um, in 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 our own flesh. If, when I talk about flesh, I'm not talking about sin, but in, you know, just our, mm -hmm. our own humanity. Um, when you think about things of what could happen in the future, you you think about it as a as a human person, you know. Um, but in the moment, you ask the Lord. You know, Lord, how do I respond to this? I mean, uh, which way should I go? You know, and uh, um, but it's it's always the grace of God. It's nothing that's in ourselves because if it was in ourselves, man, we'd run and yeah. just run. And, uh, and sometimes we are supposed to run. We have to hear that voice, yeah. still small voice, telling us what to do. Yeah. And in the midst of our panic. Yeah. Yeah. Of the moment. <laughs> so one the question that I asked you, Peter, at that men's group was, would you do it the same way? And and I I was expect because I know you you guys are 
the yeah. epitome of sweet, kind, gentle missionaries. And I'm and I don't mean that. I mean that you are pow- two powerhouses. And I, when I asked you this question, Peter, I was expecting you to come back with an answer of, "Oh, I will always have faith. I will, you know, yes, He will provide and protect." And and you turned to me and you said, "I don't know if I will have faith in the next moment." Right. And that and and it was so real and so beautiful and so honest. And I felt that struggle of a father. And I know you feel the same way, Debbie. But that that it was this moment of each each time I face these things. Um, there has been a a wave of faith that is that has moved yeah. in my heart. But if it doesn't happen, you're like, if it doesn't happen, I'm swinging for the fences. You're like, you know, like, <laughs> every situation is a moment of of trial. It's a it's a moment of of where God wants to lead you deeper. It, you, I mean, you can we can be happy just living at a normal level level of faith and so forth. But I believe that God allows these things because God could have prohibited those those robbers from coming into the to children's center. He could have. But every situation that happens is a moment where God takes us or wants to take us, and we can respond if we want to, and we can respond if we uh, negatively as well. He won't reject us for that. Mm-hmm. But he, he, he loves to take us deeper in our faith and walk with the Lord if we're willing to. If we're not willing to, he doesn't get upset with us at all. It's just an invitation for him, yeah. uh, for us to be able to walk in a deeper way, you know? Yeah. yeah. And that's what I want. That's really what I want. Through it all, we come to know him more, even mm. if things don't turn out the way we thought it should, in our own desire. Mm. Mo- yeah. I find that most people lo- lo- maybe not lose faith, but really struggle with their faith in those moments where you're in obedience, you're, you're serving in Spain, and that act of service, bringing you there to minister to this pastor, whatever took place in that house before, brought you and your family to a place of great, great danger. And I know your daughter, she's going to have to walk that moment out with with the Lord and her faith. But many people, in my experience, they shift their focus, they shift their faith in those moments of tension. How have you guys maintained that that zeal, that fire, that passion, and the continued the continued desire to serve in the middle of that chaos, knowing that there's potential for more. Yes. I think it's a, it's a, a decision that we made together way back before when, like when we got married and we went to Spain, we just gave our whole heart to Jesus in, in, in ministry to serve the Lord. And there was no option. We, we, we just burned our bridges and there's no looking back. And, uh, we just wanted to walk with the Lord and serve him all the days of our lives. And um, so if we, when we countered these situations, there was, it didn't even enter into our minds that we would, we would choose the easier road and uh, maybe look for a place of ministry that's less dangerous or, or whatever. No, if this is where God wants us to be, then it's the best place to be. Mm-hmm. And uh, because easily he could have taken us out. And places somewhere that was going to be nice and easy for our children to grow up in a nice, easy place, comfortable with everything. But he didn't. He he told us we we're going to have seven children, and they and they, you know, they had to grow up in a very difficult place, you know. And it was a challenge for them, but the Lord just worked in them, is what the way He worked in us too. And they could see our faith, our trust in God, working out in all the difficult times that we went through. And with happiness, with joy, mm. because we weren't complaining and so forth in front of our children. And we they saw that we weren't hurt by that. You know, we just continued to trust the Lord and knew that what his ways were, they were the best ways. And mm. and he's so worthy. Yeah. He's so worthy. And, you know, people who don't know him, they go through these things, too. So if you have to go through these things, it's <laughs> Through them with the Lord, <laughs> you know. So let's just go and be with Him wherever He is, and and He'll be with us. Yeah, so so amazing. I I uh, I tackled a guy in in the in Pemba once, and I did a few other things too, which I won't go into. But uh, I stopped him, and uh, I brought him to a police station, and he got beat at that police station. 
when I brought him there. I'll, I'll never forget. I was walking away, and I could hear him screaming. As, the, as I was exiting, the police officer took his belt off and just began to wail on him. And I, I felt this conviction of, like, he, he, stole, he stole a passport, and I had a team, and they weren't going to be able to, she wasn't going to be able to leave. She, you know, it, it was like I had this conviction in him, and it happened so fast. I did whatever I could to stop it. And as I left, I had this struggle of, you know, justice, right? Well, it is justice. And, but at the same time, I'm a missionary. I'm not there to fix everything. I'm there to bring Jesus. And I remember like having this joy, right? That we got it. We got the passport back and justice was served. And then I remember like hearing this 18, I think it was 16 or 18 years old at the time, just screaming. And I went back the next day, paid his bail and led, led him to the Lord. Um, but even in that, that, that one altercation marked me. You know, my, you know, Emmeline, Emmeline's my sister for all of you guys who don't know. I was not in Pemba. I was visiting home when she was attacked on the road in between the two bases. And she, three guys jumped on top of her and took out a knife. She has a huge, you know, cut and scar on her arm from that altercation. And if I would, if I was in Pemba, I don't know what I would have done. I would have gone to the village with a hundred dollar bill saying, you know, anyone that brings me any of those guys, you know, you'll get this and then more. And I, yeah. Um, what's that? We were there when she came afterwards. You were? Yeah, yeah we, were there. we remember that. We, we were there like comforting her and praying with her and yeah, just standing with her. It was, it was a tough moment. Yeah. I've watched her go through two of those. Uh, one was with the attack, and that was her greatest fear. She said, Lord, I'll go serve on the missions field, but don't don't ever, like, I don't want to be in that sort of situation. It happened within the first three months. And then a few months after that, I'm sure you guys were there as well. I know you guys were there with Lori. And that whole situation as as that second, you know, that second tragic, difficult moment where where you begin to question your call and question what, what you're going to do. And I watched her face those two. Um, and come out stronger, better, more in love, more trusting in the Lord than ever. Um, I've had them in my own life with my own wife, and 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 if anybody's ever heard me preach, you've heard me share maybe on the my Congo story. I had to face that when, when Musi went into the Congo with me and Herbert uh, and Cassandra years ago. But for those who are watching that are so separate from this, that are so you know they're 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 serving at home, they're they're working their job, you know, they're loving the Lord, they feel that call to do something, but that wall, that blockage of what if something horrible happens, what would you, if, if you were sitting in front of them, what would you say t- to them? <laughs> uh, I would say that the Lord, the Lord loves them. And and the Lord in his grace will prepare them if it's going, if something's going to happen there. They don't have to worry about it. Uh, Jesus says, just live one day at a time. You know, you, you don't have to worry about tomorrow. Just, just do what you have to do today. So many times our imagination brings us a lot of fear. And we can try and imagine what something might be happening or might happen in the future. Uh, we've heard stories and so forth, so our imagination runs away with us. So, the Lord Jesus says, no, just live today. Mm. And, uh, and the grace that he gives us will equip us for whatever he wants us to go through. Uh, but he knows up to what point we're able to handle stuff. Yeah. And he doesn't take, wants us, want us to take one big jump into something without, first of all, taking us step by step, building our faith, our trust in him, yeah. and dealing with issues in our own personal life. Mm. And when he does that, it's through little things that happen every day. And uh, when we get to a place like what happened to us, uh, it's the grace of God that is enabling us to go through that too. Come yeah. on. Debbie, go for yeah. it. What, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, he says he'll never give us more above than what we can, you know, bear. And he'll always give us an escape out of, of you know, trials. So, yeah. so I think... I think it's the same. I remember when I just got back from Australia and he'd gone to Brazil with Annalisa and I was there by myself with the baby. All the kids were in Pemba. Um, it was at the time when Carmelie had malaria, had been dying from malaria. She was 
trying to get better. And then they came back to us, had a big accident on the way, and then the accident company was healed. I believe I told that another time, I think. But it was at that time, and I was by myself waiting in the house with the baby, and they had canceled the police that had been sent for months to look after us there at the base. Well, to look after us. God was looking after us, but you know, these policies. Yeah, no, I know, yeah. Present, it was present. actually such a human comfort at, at that time. And I came back and Peter said to me on the phone, oh, we, we canceled the police. They're not going to be coming anymore. Every night, two policemen would come. Yeah. And I thought, how did they cancel the police when now I'm going to be here by myself? And I would go checking all the doors and the windows and, 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 I, and, I, and I thought, oh, I don't know, Lord, why did they do this? And the Lord corrected me and he said, Debbie, why are you worrying? Mm. If I was to allow anything to happen in that moment, my grace will be sufficient. And, I, and I'll be there for you at that moment. But you can let the enemy rob you every day if you want with fear. Mm. Or you can just let that one moment happen if it ever happens and I'll be there for you. you know? wow. and, I, and I try to really receive that and walk in that. I don't say that I didn't ever check the doors again. <laughs> but but I, I remember what he said to me. Yeah, don't let wow. yourself be robbed every day by fear. And to the people who feel like God maybe might be going to call them somewhere and they know they're in an ordinary job, an ordinary world, and they can't fathom how that would even be, don't let fear stop you from obeying God. Yeah. Because the treasure of walking with him is, 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 is really worth it. It's it's so uh, apparent in in your life in the life of your children and uh, I just I love this I I just want to start like a wisdom of the Wilcox podcast and just it would just be you Can, I want to close this with one <laughs> Wilcox wisdom copyright it uh, Corey Matt there we go um, I would like to ask you one last question uh, I didn't I didn't have the ver- I think it's Matthew twenty two Matthew fourteen I forget it, what it is exactly but where Jesus says Get some swords. There, I've researched this. I don't have a clear answer on it. Uh, but as you have read that verse, know that verse, how would you interpret it really quickly? Well, now uh, I would take the swords. I mean, in those times, swords was uh, the obvious weapon, you know. But now uh, I believe the sword is the word of the Lord and uh, where we need to be equipped with the word of the Lord and to be able to respond with the word of the Lord at, at the moments when they actually need, uh, people need to receive the word. And with the word of the Lord, we can also yeah, send an enemy packet, you know. So um, for me, that's, that's, what I, that's how I receive that now. Okay. And it doesn't matter uh, what situation you go through, um, it doesn't really need a physical response. I think it needs a, a, a response of faith and trust and with the word of the Lord uh, to that situation. <laughs> uh, this How about be, you, Debbie? This might be completely wrong, right? But uh, I, I'm not saying people can never use any form of defense. I'm not mm-hmm. saying that. But sometimes when I've read those verses, I've almost thought like the Lord was trying to say something and they totally got it wrong. And mm-hmm. he was like, oh, it's enough. <laughs> you don't get it, but it, yeah, yeah, it will do. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I love because I think in the same in in the previous scriptures he was saying or earlier on when he was commissioning the disciples, he said, "Don't take sandals, don't take a purse." And then when he was when he was about to ascend, he goes, "You, you know, remember what I said about the sandals and stuff? Yeah, like take a purse and take some swords." Um, Either way, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, I just, I just know that I super love you guys, and you guys are a just a beautiful example of his faithfulness and your zeal and passion for him. You know, um, uh, Mark, Mark eleven. What's that? Thank you. We love you too. Oh, come on, you, Mark eleven. <laughs> uh, faith of God, right? And and some people actually. Translate that to be the faith of God. Uh, you know, faith in God or faith of God. You guys have both. Uh, so uh, I just, I just love you guys. 
Well, it's been a long journey. Yeah. I if you could do... Since 1979. Wow. wow. 1996. Uh, no, 79, yes. 1979, yeah. I've been on the fish field, and so it's been a long journey coming to this place. Yeah. Well, I love it. I, I love that we get to run together. I know I'm not with you, but the times I do get to be with you and your family are very cherished moments. Anything you guys need, let me know. Um, and if people want to reach out to you, connect with you, yeah. uh, support you guys, is there any way that they can do that? Yeah. Um, if they want to contact um, Irish Global Office or if they want to email us on our email, pedlwilcox at, yeah, at um, gmail.com. <laughs> okay. Say that one more time. P? P-E. Yeah. D-L Wilcox at gmail.com. Awesome. Well, love you guys. Thank you so much for this, for this time. Listen, guys, uh, those of you who are watching, you need to realize um, that there are people out there that, that are not only struggling with the same things that you're struggling with, that those, those complex questions and that have, and have pioneered a way you're not alone in that. And if this, uh, if this time with the Wilcox has blessed you, just share it with somebody. Um, you know, this is such a great word. I think it's a great season for us to even be talking about these things. So share this, like it, subscribe, uh, do all the internet things that you're supposed to do on a video. And, uh, and we will see you on the next uh, podcast. Love you guys.